This is David Kurtz with TPM Media. We're here at Netroot Nation with uh, Dahlia Lithwick from Slate.com. And Dahlia does a lot of coverage of various Justice Department scandals, as have we, and uh, was on a panel here today talking about the first 100 days of accountability in a new administration. Why don't you tell me a little bit about the, uh, the, the methods and means by which you would go about having that kind of accountability? It was, it was a really interesting discussion. I think that, you know, we all sort of agree that what the problems are, you know, and we talked about rendition and we talked about torture and we talked about uh, Blackwater and we talked uh, about signing statements. That's all done. And then there was this sort of really interesting conversation about whether there can be accountability, what accountability would look like. I think, you know, it's interesting that we're already falling into this trap of either positing Nuremberg-style war crimes, you know, tribunals, or nothing, you know, immunizing everyone from John Yoo uh, up and down. And I think it's, it's, it's a really useful conversation to sit here on a panel with people from CCR, people from the ACLU, and hear everybody sort of say there's a lot of gray area in between that, and that accountability doesn't necessarily mean Nuremberg, it doesn't necessarily mean nothing. It means p possibly a you know, truth commission, possibly appointing uh, you know, someone, someone to, to a special prosecutor to look at it, but certainly that long before we make a decision to do what, say, Stuart Taylor suggested this week, which is immunize everybody in advance, uh, or alternatively make a decision to trot them out, you know, before a war crimes tribunal, before the whole world, we should really find out what's happened really get a look at these OLC memos that nobody's seen, get a look at up and down the chain of command who made what decisions, and then really start to move forward on what happened and then what do we do with it. And I think that's a useful way to parse this. So, so a factual investigation first before you then start deciding where to go with the legal consequences of, of what's been done. Because right. at this point, we're still in the dark. Well, and that's, you know, one of the key points, and I think um, Jamil Jaffer made this from the ACLU, one of the really key purposes to having accountability is finding information. And, you know, he described what it's like to get declassified documents, or, to, I'm sorry, he described what it's like to get documents turned over that are 23 pages of blank, you know, blanked out documents. I mean, that's the level at which they're still operating. So we need to really think hard, not just about accountability viewed as some kind of witch hunt, you know, where we all go after John Yu with our flaming torches and pitchfork. We're talking about accountability to find out what actually happened, who made what decisions. Clearly, there's been almost no consequences. You know, Congress is only sort of awakening from its slumber and looking into the question of how the torture policy was formed. Let's find out everything. Let's look at all the memos for the first time, and then we can make, a, I think, a smart, informed decision about you know, whether, whether there should be accountability. And I also think we talked a lot today about this notion that it's bad for America. You know, it'll rip America apart if we have hearings or we have criminal trials or we have, if we have war crimes tribunals. And I think it's really worse for America if we don't. There's been really two prongs to the Bush administration's lawlessness. One is this claim of limitless executive power. We answer to no one, we do it in secret. And the second is, I think, almost the more pernicious one, where in advance even of doing some of what we do, right. we immunize the people who do it. And one of the things that's really becoming clear about the torture policy was that almost as soon as the decision was taken to begin to torture people, the decision was being taken to try to figure out how to immunize them. Right. Uh, so that was one part of it, was immunizing, and now we saw it in the recent FISA, FISA right. bill. You know, make sure that whatever happens, Nobody gets uh, hauled into court, uh, and the other prong of it, I think, was was sidelining judicial review. Right, whether I mean, just it's taking the judicial authority, judicial authority away entirely, statutorily, and saying you, you can't look at this. Right, right, right. And I think it's important to really understand that this was one of the goals of the Bush administration from the outset. I mean, this is why Guantanamo was selected as the, you know, it wasn't an accident that right. we wanted to send It was extraterritorial. It was, the point was to right. have no court review, and in fact, once there was court review, there was no point in Guantanamo. I think the same is true over and over again. We see in the habeas stripping provisions uh, of the Military Commissions Act, over and over again, we see these efforts to say, we're gonna get rid of judicial scrutiny. And then I think my, my third point was, if I remember, correctly was that this state secret doc doctrine, right? Well, that and, and the, um, the, the judges that have been appointed that are basically sympathetic to these interpretations. So you've got really three levels at which 
they've distanced themselves from court scrutiny. Right, and I think that that's almost the most important and the least told story here, is that we just keep forgetting that, and I really do believe that when President Bush lay awake at night thinking about how to transform the courts, he wasn't thinking about Roe v. Wade. That's been a horrible misimpression that progressives have, that that's what he cared about. What he cared about, I think, was executive power and putting people on the district courts, the courts of appeals, that had his view, this sort of very, very, very strong view of an imperial presidency, and he almost got it. I mean, he's gotten much closer to it with, with John Roberts and Sam Alito. He's got two jurists who really do sign off on his view of executive power, and I think that failing to understand how much he's transformed the courts in the last eight years and failing to really think about how we can correct for that in the next administration is going to really be short-sighted on the part of progressives. I think you mentioned that, that the only thing standing between Bush version of executive power and, um, and, and some other <laughs> more reasonable way is, is an 87-year-old justice. Of John right. Paul Stevens right. and his John D. Bowtie. And I think that, you know, we keep hearing at every election cycle that the court is, is really, you know, on the brink. But now demographics suggest that is simply true. You know, Justice Stevens, Justice Ginsburg, Justice Souter wants to be off the court. It's an open secret. So there are possibly three vacancies, all of liberals. And uh, certainly if McCain is elected and those three liberal seats become, uh, you know, not just conservative seats, but as McCain has been pledging, you know, he wants the same fire in your belly, belt and suspenders, lifetime Federalist Society guys. America's going to be unrecognizable. Tell me about, just off the top of your head, the three most important Supreme Court decisions from the last term. Well, certainly I think indisputably Boumediene is, is the most important. The most and that important, was hands the, down. The habeas, the habeas decision that really for the first time, and it was very dramatic even in the, the progression of war on terror cases, the most dramatic because it actually granted affirmative rights to habeas corpus uh, to prisoners at Guantanamo. And that, that was breathtaking, not just uh, in the results, but in the, the court got there. I think that anybody who watched oral argument thought that that case was not going to be a big win. Uh, for progressives, and so that was was uh, a really stunning, I think, landmark case. Um, I think the Heller, the gun case, would be the other uh, the other end of the spectrum. Just completely, completely, two years ago, if you had told me that we were going to start reading after all these years an individual right to right. bear arms into the this Second was the Amendment. case that that struck down the, the DC, DC gun, gun ban, ban. Right. The, the, and and it was. You know, this was, was a sort of tour de force for Justice Scalia's reading of the Constitution, and it was really a dramatic, I think, example of, of ways in which liberals have almost completely given up on the issue of, of guns. I mean, it was very, very, very stunning to see the lack of hue and cry after that case. And in fact, Obama came out saying, oh, I, I'm for individual reading of the Second Amendment too. This is, this is a sea change in the way liberals talk about guns. And I don't think anyone saw that coming five years ago. Uh, probably the third, I mean, there were, there were a lot of big ones, but I think for me, the other big, big one was the, the, the uh, voter ID case that came down where surprisingly, I think for a lot of liberals, Justice Stevens voted. Uh, to uphold a, a voter ID rule that really with no evidence, no evidence of vote fraud in Indiana, uh, a clearly partisan effort. This was, was, you know, right down the line. Every judge who ever looked at this law divided Republican, Democrat on whether or not they found it constitutional. And in that case, Justice Stevens really surprised a lot of liberals and voted with the conservatives to say, well, there's just, even though there's no evidence of vote fraud, there's also no evidence that voters have been turned away at the polls. And so it was this sort of, I think I described it as a specter fighting with a chimera, you know, these two non-existent uh, pieces of evidence. And, and the idea that Justice Stevens made it easier, much easier for states to enact voter ID laws that will clearly burden uh, minorities and, and poor people, uh, clearly will burden the elderly, uh, was really, really, again, uh, another sort of sea change at the court and one that largely went unnoticed, I think. Well, great. We appreciate your time here. Thank you for having me. This is David Kurtz for TPM Media in Austin with Dahlia Lithwick from Slate.com.